that it will design tiny television cameras to be implanted in plastic penises so that we can see the changes in the color of the vaginal wall as it approaches orgasm. I mean, these guys are unstinting in their devotion to truth in any form. And yet, and yet, for 30 years, science has accepted government's uh, refusal to allow science to look at the potential impact of psychedelic plants and compounds on human consciousness, on chronic alcoholism, on schizophrenia, on depression, on autism, on uh, learning disorders, on uh, dyslexias, on uh, memory enhancements, so forth and so on. This to me is obscene. The future is mental. Figure it out. If the mind does not loom large in the future history of this species, then what the hell kind of future is it going to be? I mean, this is our crowning glory, our uh, aesthetic sensitivities, our ability to create values that are not simply uh, based on the next meal, the next sexual encounter, the next uh, empowering social move, but an ability to create social values based on uh, creating a viable future environment for children, uh, creating a, a viable present environment for the less fortunate among us, uh, creating a, a social safety net so that the, mo the more maladaptive of us are not uh, reduced to living under bridges and in abandoned automobiles. I mean, these are the things which set us above the apes. These are the things which take us out of the context of organic nature and make it seem as though, hey, there actually are some transcendental values being maximized here. There actually is something going on in, within the human family that if it were to be lost, fumbled away, compromised, or destroyed, the universe would be a poorer place for it, truly a poorer place for it. And I think, uh, I think we take our humanness too much for granted. I don't think we realize uh, how nasty, brutish, and short most of life has been over the centuries and how really only in the, within the confines of the 20th century has uh, a level of uh, comfort and food availability and shelter and uh, basic creature needs been met to the point where most people can begin to lead the philosophical life that previously was uh, the privilege of emperors kings, great courts. Now we all indulge ourselves. We all have the philosopher king's point of view. We all uh, have a model of history, a model of the future. And we all uh, feel capable of stepping into the shoes of our leaders and discharging that responsibility. Well, in order to do that, I think we need to overcome our amnesia about how we got to this place. I don't see, you see what science would have you believe and explicitly implies is that we are an aberration. Here over here you have nature, the beautiful rainforests, the wonderful coral reefs, the symmetry of the hummingbird, the sea urchin, and the butterfly. And here you have us, grimy, tawdry, polluting, ugly, driven, in, equilibri in disequilibrium, in denial. I don't believe that. I believe that this kind of thinking that breaks 
humanity away from the rest of nature is the first of the great disempowering myths by which the Western mind has enslaved itself. And we are not outside of nature. We are not a runaway, toxic process. We are not a mutation. We are, in fact, that part of nature which has been deputized for a purpose. We are the energy gathering aspect of the Gaian mind. We are the language forming capacity of nature herself. You may know the concept of a catalyst in chemistry. A catalyst is something which when you stir it into a chemical reaction, the reaction proceeds more quickly but the catalyst itself is not destroyed. And this is what I think we are. We are a strategy on the part of the Gaian mind to produce an effect that would otherwise take much, much longer to produce. The main effect of the presence of human life on this planet has been to vastly accelerate the speed at which nature is able to uh, creatively express herself. And I would like to believe that this fragile, fragile thing which we call humanness which is nothing more than a, a, a set of interlocking ideas which we share. Ideas about caring and responsibility and generations yet unborn and obligation to the integrity of the earth and so forth and so on. I would like to believe that these things arose in us in a very, very brief window of opportunity. Uh, as you may or may not know, um, all, you know, there's a lot of talk about the relationship between the masculine and the feminine in human beings and gender issues and so forth and so on. Well, if you go back into the primate line, what you discover is Primates always have dominance hierarchies occupied by males. This is the bad news part of the thing. You see, it isn't that we are a perversion of the primate program. At this point, we exemplify it uh, uh, right down the line. But clear back to squirrel monkeys, you get, uh, you get male dominance hierarchies. Why is this? And why then is it even an issue for us? Why don't we just blindly accept it? I mean, there isn't a woman's liberation movement among termite societies or, uh, you know, among reindeer herds. So why, why are we so, so discomforted by our attitudes toward each other? Well, I believe it's because uh, we actually created, at a certain point in our history, a kind of paradise. We actually solved all the problems which now bedevil us uh, 20 to 15,000 years ago. And how this happened, and half of you, I hope, are amazed, and the other half will groan because you've heard it so many times before, uh, what happened is an evolutionary synergy that occurred on the plains of Africa sometime over the last 100,000 years. It's that as the African continent dried up, our remote primate ancestors were forced out of the trees and on to the African grassland where they were in an environment completely different from the kind of environment that our ancestors had been living in for millions of years. Gone were the fruit-filled bowers of the climaxed canopy of the rainforest. And instead, what there was 
was uh, a, a grass.